In our gospel reading, Jesus says to us today, this, excuse me, Jesus says to us today, this very night, your life is being demanded of you. This very night, your life is being demanded of you. Maybe we can hear that since we're not at night or in the day. Maybe we can hear that for us who are awake this morning. This very day, your life is being demanded of you. For me, that's the most biting line of the whole reading. And I'm left with a whole barrage of questions that come on after hearing that, right? What did I do? Why is my life being demanded of me? What does that even mean in the first place? Is it talking about my physical death? And if that's the case, how is that going to happen? And why now? I mean, I've got a baby on the way. Can't I see her be born first? I'm not ready, frankly, for my life to be demanded of me. I don't believe any of us are. If you give us the choice between life and death, most of us are going to choose life. We choose to live. We choose more time. We choose what we know because we know it. Life is what we know. And so we choose the security of knowing. Even if we don't like it, even if it's filled with disappointment and dashed hopes or illness and pain or depression and fear, we're comfortable with what we know. When someone tells us that our life is being demanded of us, we tend to react. And oftentimes, we tend to react not in a good way. We react out of our anxiety, and our anxiety tells us to immediately react in a way that puts us on guard. What if I have done something wrong for my life to be demanded of me? What if I have looked at or valued the wrong things in life? We're put on guard. And in the big scheme of things and the reality of life, sometimes that's where we stay. We stay on guard. We stay in the realm of looking for things that might not be there. We stay in the realm of the familiar because there's fear in the unknown. We're so caught up, we're so immobilized because we're looking for who we are or who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do and how others are supposed to perceive us. And we're so consumed by that way of living, by anxiety, that we often forget the real world that we live in is the kingdom of God. That isn't to say that the world we live in isn't real, but it isn't the ultimate. As Christians, we don't live in a world where we are constantly on guard. We live in a world of truth. And our truth is constantly being revealed to us each and every day. That's the subtle shift that Jesus is making in the parable of the barn guy. Most of the headings, if you were to look up our gospel reading in your Bible and the pews, maybe if they have headings, most of the headings will call this story in Luke's gospel the parable of the rich fool. But I personally like the parable of the barn guy better. You see, this story starts out with Jesus' teaching on confession. And he's interrupted by a guy who asked Jesus to tell his brother to to divide his family inheritance with him. Now, Jesus normally doesn't mind getting involved in matters of justice. But here in this story that's unique to Luke, he doesn't take the bait. Jesus wants to dismiss the guy and say that he's not going to get involved in that dispute, thank you very much, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now, while Jesus doesn't engage this man, he does use the situation to teach about wealth and particularly about the seduction of wealth. Jesus tells the parable about the barn guy. The barn guy is rich. He owns some land which produces abundantly. You know, the fruit is growing awesome this year. The sweet potatoes are in. The asparagus is looking great. He's got a great harvest. And he thinks to himself, where am I going to keep all of that stuff? And he finally settles on tearing down everything he owns to build larger barns for the multiplying harvest that is bountiful for him. And after he does this, he can finally sit back and say to himself, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Now as we come to try and understand this parable, or we try and ask Martin Luther's famous question, Was ist das? Or what is this? We should note some things about the farmer. We tend to think of the farmer as a bad guy. 
But he joins, we tend to think of the farmer as a bad guy, as he joins the ranks of hoarders who buy larger and larger houses so they can accumulate more stuff. Maybe we tend to think of him as wicked, but there's no indication of that in the reading. He's not, he's not gained wealth by doing something illegal or taking advantage of other people. He's not portrayed as particularly greedy either. He's actually seems somewhat surprised by his wealth and the abundance of the harvest. But he has a right to set some things aside because in the area that he lives in, it's known for being particularly susceptible to drought and famine. So it's natural that he would be on guard in that sense. And we might ask, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with being cautious about what might come up for us in the future? The answer to that is a simple nothing, except Except that the barn guy's sole focus throughout this whole conversation is with himself. His good fortune has curved his vision so that everything he sees starts and ends with himself. Listen to him. He says, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. I will do this. I will put up, I will pull down barns and build larger ones. Then I will store my grain and my goods Then I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. There's no one else in the world here but himself. Never mind the servants and the gardeners that helped with the picking of the harvest and the planting of the crops. There's no mention of taking care of them or sharing his abundance with the poor, the widow, or the stranger like he's supposed to do. There's not even a mention from him about God and giving thanks to God or giving thanks, period, for any sort of blessing that might have come his way. The barn guy is totally devoid of God, and what becomes like God to him is none other than me, myself, and I. And this line of thinking for the barn guy leads to something else that Jesus points out. Remember, most Bibles call this the parable of the rich fool. And the, par- the barn guy is not foolish because he makes provision or plans for his future, but he's foolish because he believes that by his wealth he can secure his future. Again, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. The barn guy is labeled a fool because he places infinite value on finite things. And we're not immune to that ourselves. In our culture, especially in North America, but it's not just limited to us, we're told that our value and our worth as human beings is on how much we have and what we buy. You know, the latest and the greatest smartphone, the faster, sleeker, shinier laptop, the bigger and better TV with the surround sound, the collection of shoes or pampered chef items or lakefront property. We're so ingrained to buy and shop for these items because if we have them, we'll find our true sense of ultimate worth. That is until we don't. That is until we buy all of these things and what we're ultimately seeking is not found in these things. But our culture keeps encouraging us to shop till you drop because it has to be in one of them. It just has to be. Now hear me, I'm not saying that buying stuff is bad. I'm not saying that. Nor am I saying you need to go sell all your stuff and give money away. What I'm hoping is that we can do what one scholar suggests. What I'm hoping is that we can turn the question from is having lots and lots of stuff bad to is our lots and lots of stuff sufficient to meet the weight of meaning, significance, and joy that we seek. And my hunch to that last question is no. The gifts of ultimate worth, dignity, and relationship are not met in materiality. They're met in the God who gives us these things freely and who urges us to help others realize those freely given gifts of God for themselves. God, through Jesus, says to the barn guy, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? Wealth is part of the abundance of life, and in the kingdom of God, it's not about hoarding it for ourselves, but about giving it away to others. After all, you've heard the phrase, you can't take your stuff with you when you die, right? 
What if we give our stuff away? What if we give our abundance away, trusting that God always has us covered? What would that look like if we actually did that? You see, our life is being demanded of us, this day and this moment. But our lives and our abundance aren't really ours, they're God's in the first place. That means we are just stewards of God and of God's mysteries. We're caretakers, or if you like the analogy from big cities, we're just renters. We're stewards of our lives and of our wealth, but all we have belongs to God, and our future also rests in God, making us secure beyond all measure. And if that's as true as we, be, we proclaim and we believe, then nothing is more valuable than God and God's love for us and the world. So let our lives be demanded of us, because our lives are secure in Christ Jesus our Lord. That gives us the opportunity to truly live life, not in a manner or lens of scarcity, but in the reality of trust, hope, mercy, and abundance, so that we may share our life and our possessions with others. That's what it means to be rich toward God as we live fully in the kingdom of God both now and forever. Amen.